And now I'm happy to introduce Dr. Raphael Kalisch, who is a professor at the University of Mainz at Germany and a research group leader at the renowned Leibniz Institute of Resilience. He unfortunately also couldn't be here in person, so we're going to play his video. There is um, a resilience-specific conference happening in Mainz later this year, so if you're interested in this topic, I encourage you to go. Good morning, everybody. My name is Raphael Kalisch. I'm very grateful uh, to have the chance to present uh, some of our findings to you today. I'm particularly grateful to Katharina for putting this wonderful symposium together. Uh, and I very much regret that I can't be there in person and discuss with you. Uh, another round of thanks uh, goes to my funders, obviously. Um, and then uh, special thanks uh, to these two people, Scott Russell from Mount Sinai and Marianne Müller, who's also based in Mainz who have written this review together with me. Well, this review is a very long story of roughly something like 60 pages or so. So it needs to, some short cutting. Uh, and uh, the cutting short is essentially this. Um, this is a very preliminary working model of uh, biological resilience mechanisms. In the brain, this model <clears throat> is centered on the functions of the hippocampus, in particular, uh, the dentate gyrus, uh, the reward system, and the prefrontal cortex. Um, these areas are affected, modulated in their function by the immune system, uh, by the gut. Um, an important role is also played by uh, the integrity of the barriers between the gut, the rest of the body and the blood and the brain. Uh, and all these areas show a decent amount of neuroplasticity. Um, the functions of the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus and the prefrontal cortex seem to have particularly role in, particular role in protecting you against the negative effects of rather singular or event-like stressors, like, for instance, singular traumata, uh, by well, uh, reducing the risk that you will develop uh, stress-related disorders that is characterized by circumscribed pathological fears um, in the aftermath. Uh, whereas the reward system seems to be more important in protecting you against the effects of more massive and chronic and long-term stresses, such as can lead, for instance, to the development of depression, uh, or generalized anxiety, so generally speaking, disorders of the anxiety misery spectrum. Well, even this story is uh, too long for a 15 minute talk, uh, so I will limit myself to uh, just these uh, brain systems here. And I stress again, everything is very preliminary. Um, well, what are the basic concepts that I'm using? Uh, in this re review, we uh, look at resilience as an outcome. That means you maintain your mental health in the long run, maybe have some kind of quick uh, impairment, but in the long run, uh, after some phase of stress exposure, you will be okay again, or you stably maintain your mental health. That would be the opposite of, for instance, developing uh, more or less severe problems uh, in the aftermath of life phase uh, of stress exposure or a very uh, severe uh, stressful event. Um, so resilience in our uh, way, in our way of looking at it, is an outcome of good long-term mental health despite adversity. Resilience factors are predictors of that outcome. So there can be predispositions, traits, skills, behavioral styles, obviously then also uh, features uh, of your brain. And if a resilience factor, which you measure here at baseline, um, is associated with a good long-term mental health, well then uh, we call it a resilience factor. A resilience mechanism is something that you do actively or a function that you recruit while uh, or after you've been exposed to stressors. So it's a way uh, of successfully dealing with a difficult situation. And the relationship between resilience factors and resilience mechanisms is then that a resilience factor will make the activation of resilience mechanisms in a difficult life situation more likely. For instance, assume good emotion regulation skills are a resilience factor, then they make it more likely that you will be able to recruit those skills and exert emotion regulation when you're confronted uh, with uh, life stresses. And this will then make a good outcome more likely. Um, well, already from these definitions, uh, you can perhaps guess that you can really only look at this in prospective longitudinal studies. So that was one criterion also for our review. Uh, and that you actually need to quantify, look at and quantify stress exposure. First of all, there's no resilience without stress exposure. It doesn't make sense to speak about resilience even in the absence of real life stresses. But then also you need to quantify those stresses and put them into the equation because just from looking at this graph, you could imagine that perhaps someone who is less exposed is more likely to
to stay on the good side of life where someone who is more strongly exposed is more likely to develop uh, long-term uh, negative consequences. So if you don't factor that out, if you don't control for stress or exposure, then uh, you might just come out uh, with a trivial result that doesn't tell you anything about individual differences uh, in coping. Um, and just one uh, second of psychological background. So there's more and more evidence, which you can read in these papers, for instance, that one key resilience factors is so-called positive appraisal style. That's a tendency or habit to evaluate stressors in a kind of realistic to mildly positive, mildly too optimistic, too self-confident fashion. And what that type of appraisal style as a, as a habit of predisposition allows you is to then actually, if you're in a difficult situation, yes, to, to mount stress reactions because you're still somehow realistic in evaluating. So you can do what you need to do to manage a difficult situation. But uh, this style will also um, avoid that you show overshooting stress reactions in terms of their magnitude or duration they will make it easier. It will make it easier for you to downregulate after uh, the termination of a stressor. So overall, you're less likely to spend too much energy and consume too much resources and finally go into allosteric overload. So that's from the questionnaire based research, but that's not the scope of our article. The scope of our article is behavior, the behavior literature, the task literature, because indirectly that also tells you something about the brain, then the human neuroimaging literature and the animal literatures about neurobiological and systems biological mechanisms. And we have limited ourselves to looking at adults only. So I'm not going to tell you anything about resilience in the young uh, today, for instance. Uh, and methods criteria, obviously, I've already told you about this, were that we wanted to look at specifically prospective longitudinal studies with control for stress exposure. They can already tell you there were not so many. So meta-analysis was not possible for us. Um, well, a brief look at the behavioral task literature. This is already uh, the summary. If you're good in discriminating threat and safety, so appraising safety as safety uh, and in learning safety. So for instance, if you're good in differentiating threat and safety in a differential fear conditioning paradigm, uh, learning uh, safety and extinction, then you're more protected. If you have a good episodic memory specificity, if you have good cognitive control, if in a appraisal task, you show positive appraisal biases, not surprisingly, if you're effective and your attentional activity stresses is relatively low, not overshooting, uh, then you're more protected. There's some but faint evidence for good reward system function also in the behavioral literature. And finally, interestingly and importantly, uh, it's good to show sufficient strong physiological stress responses. It seems that if you have a tendency to show blunted or undershooting responses, that is not good either. So we're talking here about heart rate responses, uh, hormonal responses, for instance. Now, if you take these functions and just from our knowledge of how they are related to the brain, you can roughly try to, to sort them to particular brain systems or brain areas. Um, well, for good threat, safety discrimination, safety learning, you need a pattern separation in the hippocampus and you need good reward system function. That's pretty well known and established. Uh, the dentate gyrus is also important for episodic memory specificity. Obviously, the reward system for reward system function and the prefrontal cortex in the first place for good cognitive control. Um, and then um, you could think, well, if you appraise stresses not too negatively, that's linked to a relatively uh, moderate or not, un not overshooting activation of the aversive system. But if you see that in the context of a uh, obviously good uh, role for non-blunted physiological stress reaction, that doesn't fit so well if uh, you also try to find a kind of more parsimonious and integrative explanation for these three facts here, then that would be that the systems that control the aversive system, that regulate and modulate it, in essence, uh, the pre and cognitive control system and the reward system, uh, if they function well, then you show these types of stress reactions that are optimized. So this is how, uh, from the behavioral literature, we arrive very tentatively and speculatively at these brain systems. Let us go to neuroimaging now. Uh, before I do this, I need to start with Elliot et al., a very important paper in my eyes, seminal paper. There have been others talking about power in neuroimaging. But this one was the first, and it just showed us that, for instance, if you have a predictor, so a brain uh, feature with a low stability, uh, that means a low test-retest reliability or low ICC, um, and you want to associate that robustly and reliably with a phenotype, a uh, behavioral phenotype, 
let's assume your phenotype is 0.8, that would be the case for a psychiatric phenotype, then you need many, many, many hundred subjects already. Uh, and unfortunately, um, task-based fMRI measures, region of interest-based measures are typically or always actually in the very poor to fair range. That means, for instance, if you want to get something decent from task-based fMRI, you need well, nearly up to 1,000 subjects. The situation is much, much better for you for structural imaging measures who have a very high ICC, nearly one. So here with 100 to 200 people, you can already achieve something. So that's just an important methodological uh, concern. Uh, and this is also why we placed a lot of emphasis on sufficient power in the studies and on replication of effects. All right. Um, well, brain structure, that's, as I said, is already is the... Um, kind of most uh, favorable situation. And there's pretty good evidence that the volume, good volume of the dentate gyrus is a resilience factor. Just to give you one example from the literature, as an example that I find particularly impressive, this is a study by the lab of Karin Rulofs in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. They looked at police recruits who started going into a one year stressful training phase, including traumatizing events and a lot of other stress. They scanned them before and afterwards. What you see here is that some of them developed post-traumatic stress symptoms over the course of the year. Others uh, stayed stable, yet others uh, reduced uh, their post-traumatic stress symptoms if they had some at the beginning. Um, and uh, well, Kokodov were able to actually parcelate the hippocampus, and that was key for their success, I think, into its different subregions, including the dentate gyrus. And they specifically found that a uh, good volume of the dentate gyrus predicts a low increase in post-traumatic stress symptoms from before to after that stressful one-year training phase. Um, the study was sufficiently powered and it did control for stress exposure in this phase of life. So here we are talking about an association. We're not talking about anything that allows accurate prediction in the sense of prognosis. That's maybe also something uh, to keep in mind. That's the case for all the studies uh, we've been looking at. Um, there's much, much less evidence in functional connectivity studies that potentially also connectivity of the hippocampus with the rest of the brain and then connectivity within the reward system might be uh, resilience factors. I forgot to mention that um, the reliability of functional connectivity is somewhere between task-based fMRI and structural imaging around an ICC of 0.5 to 0.6. So there's already a slightly better chance to find something with this measure than uh, to find something well with uh, task-based fMRI. Maybe, maybe the reward system function of the reward system in reward task is important uh, for resilience. Uh, well, and that's already what we got from the imaging literature. Now, if you put these four sources of evidence together, uh, one interesting thing is that we never really found anything uh, that could be trusted outside these systems, including not in the aversive system. So at least there is some converging evidence, if you wish, for these three brain systems or brain areas. Now, what does the animal literature tell us? The animal literature, obviously, or animal researchers have the advantage that they can do experimental manipulations, they can do invasive experiments. Um, and the funny thing is, again, we find these three systems and not much evidence for anything outside, including in the aversive system. There's another funny thing that these three systems are also those in the brain that are the most sensitive to damaging effects of long-term exposure to stress hormones as well as to long-term stress-related uh, peripheral low-grade inflammation, which can lead to damage of the blood-brain barrier and then influx into the brain parenchyma of inflammation mediators. So the regions that are really most important for resilience are also those that are most affected by long-term uh, stress exposure. Um, just to give you some examples from the animal literature, because it's such an impressive literature, adult neurogenesis in the dentate child seems to be important, as well as plasticity there. And these uh, seem to be in the con important in the context of good threat safety discrimination. So appraising safety as something good and as existent. Um, appraising things as controllable, uh, realizing that things are controllable and having a generalized control beliefs is associated with the MPFC and that makes animals more resilient. And finally, if you find good things in even stressful social confrontations, for instance, if you find sources of reward there, if you can appraise a stress of termination as actually what it is, the end of something bad and the beginning of something good, then uh, if you're a mouse, you're all, also more protected. Um, so that is the reason why we came up with this working model. 
And just to try to link it, what I told you before about the psychological background from the questionnaire-based literature, our idea is now to show essentially that the function of these systems uh, is protective because they shape your appraisal style towards the positive. They allow you to detect safety, to detect reward, uh, to, for instance, do uh, positive cognitive reappraisal with your cognitive control functions in the brain. So in essence, to, um, uh, to be able to, as a function of a realistic and mildly positive appraisal of stressors, produce optimized stress reactions that help you to manage difficult situations, but do not overshoot. And this is then why they make you more resilient. Well, that's the working model. That's very preliminary. I thank you a lot for your attention. If you have any questions, because I'm not there, please uh, do write me an email. And the last thing is that I would like to invite you to this meeting uh, in Mainz in Germany, end of September. This is where a wonderful panel of speakers and many, many other people are going to discuss questions of resilience as we're doing it every year. That's the 10th anniversary. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, please come to Mainz end of September. Thank you very much uh, and goodbye. I apologize, OHBM doesn't let us do a Q&A with speakers who can't be here in person, but do reach out to Raphael, he's a fantastic um, researcher. And I do want to reiterate that MINDS especially is an expertise hub in terms of resilience research. Um, they've also put out um, a comprehensive review on this positive appraisal style. And now five